Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Heidi Amspa. I work at Baker Tilly. We are an international accounting firm. Uh, I work at, in their municipal advisory practice, and we are financial advisors for local governments. I do a lot of my work here in the state of Indiana, but also in the Midwest. I work on economic development, redevelopment projects, cities, towns, and counties, all sorts of different types of projects. How long has Baker Tilly been representing the city of Carmel and its municipal Since finances? Since the mayor was mayor in 96. So we have uh, been representing the city proudly and have been able to be a part of making all of these wonderful transformational projects come to life. Bruce, introduce. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Bruce Donaldson. I'm a partner with the law firm of Barnes & Thornburg. Uh, we're a, a nationwide firm, but based here in Indianapolis. We've got around 650 lawyers. I'm in the government services and finance department, and like Heidi, I work on local public finance. Uh, so we do what we call bond council work, uh, primarily for cities, towns, and counties. A lot of redevelopment, a lot of economic development, public-private partnership type things. Uh, I've been doing this for about 30 plus years and like Heidi, uh, I've been working with Mayor Brainerd since he was first elected in the mid-90s uh, in Carmel. So we've had a lot of fun and, and interesting work uh, and, and seen um, a lot of transformative things happen here in this community. Hi, my name is Mike Lee and I'm the finance manager for the Carmel Redevelopment Department. I've been uh, working for the city for at least uh, 10 years now. And uh, at first I got started out with just working events in the city. I didn't know anything about finance. And then they said, all right, do you want to start doing the books for the events? I said, sure, I'll start doing that. They said, oh, you, you're actually good at this. You want to start doing the books for the Redevelopment Commission? I'm like, uh, okay, sure. And I've been doing it ever since. I've been learning as I go, learning a lot from Heidi and her team. Uh, and it's been a great experience working here with the city. And now he's quite the expert, I have to admit. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Henry Mostetsky. I'm the redevelopment director for the city, also the executive director of the Redevelopment Commission. Uh, Mike doesn't give himself enough credit. He's incredibly knowledgeable in the field. And the difference between Mike and Bruce and Heidi is uh, the fee structure is quite different. <laughs> and Henry's the comedian on the panel today. Well, again, thank you everyone for being here. We are gonna do a deep dive into financial tools um, that communities use, countries use, states use, um, and go from there. So this slide lists out all of the various different types of incentives that local governments have. Uh, and it's not an, an exhaustive list by any means, but tax increment finance, TIF, is one of the main items we're gonna focus on today. Tax abatement is heavily used um, here in the states. Uh, neighborhood improvement districts is a, a special assessment that is utilized in a lot of various states. Um, new market tax credits and opportunity zones are all kind of in the list of various tools and incentives that our clients use um, throughout the country. So as I mentioned, we are gonna focus of that list of incentives on tax increment finance today. Um, we're gonna get into municipal bonds at somewhat of a high level. Um, and then we're gonna talk about Carmel's case studies because this session and panel is on Carmel and how they had some of these transformative projects that you've seen pictures of, that you've done tours of, how they have financially made those projects happen. So why do communities want to do economic development? Economic development is a very you know, broad term, redevelopment. But jobs and wages obviously is a big part of it. But the improvement of quality of life and really what you know, this conference is about, making cities livable, is really why communities do economic development. And TIF is one of the main tools that, that or states and cities and towns use. So tax increment finance or TIF in other states, it's called various items. Um, there are 49 states that have TIF laws of some type um, here in the United States. Um, in Europe, they have uh, the land value capture uh, that they use and also utilize that as TIF um, in other countries as well. So it is, it is widely used across the world. 
but it's essentially an economic development tool that captures the increases of assessed value if you're talking about property taxes, um, sales taxes if you're talking about incremental sales tax, basically any revenue stream that there would be an increase because a new development is going to occur, it captures those taxes and those taxes go to a certain body of government that they use to put back into that area that they have earmarked as their TIF area. So it's kind of a specialized zone um, within the community that they're targeting development in. And so each, each law or each state has different laws as far as what their TIF statute looks like, um, but we're gonna keep it pretty high level today. So you use it to finance incentives. So if you're trying to get a company to locate in your community or retain in your community, you can use TIF as um, a revenue stream for that to build, build infrastructure, as you'll hear in a little bit. Um, tax increment is heavily used here in the city of Carmel, but it is used to induce private development, to be used you know, with public and private partnerships. Um, but the point of a TIF area is to have orderly growth. It, because again, it's a certain area that's indicated by you know, a, a list of parcels. Um, it, it's, the point is to have targeted economic development growth. Um, also the redevelopment of blighted areas. And a common misconception is that taxpayers know if they are within a TIF area or not. And I will say that most of them don't uh, because they don't pay any different taxes than they would otherwise. Can I, can I jump in for a Please, second? Please, all of you can jump in whenever. As you're walking up and down the Monon, uh, I always think of TIF as a, a paintbrush and a set of paints where it depends on who's, who's the artist and that's how you get your final product. And so it, as you walk up and down the Monon, you see that the mayor's focus has been to use TIF to change the urban planning landscape of a potential project. It's not just to incentivize a business, it's to change the way that those buildings stand with relation to where they are in the street. Thank you, so if you could visualize this maybe as a painting, as Henry said, the, the picture on the left is you know, the painting how it maybe started, and then as you know, new businesses come in and generate uh, incremental value of some type, then again, those revenues are collected and put back into that area to benefit the TIF area as a whole. So this graph is taking another little deeper dive into the TIF area. So the orange section at the very bottom represents the base value. It could be the base sales tax value, whatever it may be, whatever revenue stream it is that you're looking at. So that base assessed value, we'll just talk in property taxes for right now because most states do have property tax driven TIF areas. So that base assessed value is the assessed value of all the properties within that allocated boundary of the TIF area in the overlapping taxing units, which would be the county, the school corporation, the village, whatever it may be, receive, continues to receive that value after the TIF area is created. And any incremental increase, or the, the green area, the lime green area on this graph, is the incremental assessed value. So that is what is captured by the Redevelopment Commission or the council, or again, however your state statute is set up, and that's taken times your tax rate, and those revenues come directly to that body of government to do redevelopment, economic development within, again, that targeted area. And then all TIF areas, for the most part, have a life, meaning they are in existence for a certain period of time. In the state of Indiana right now, if you create a TIF area, it has a 25-year life. Again, each state varies in, in what that life means, but once that TIF area is, expires, then either the assessed value or again the sales tax goes to back to all of those overlapping taxing units. So ultimately it benefits all of the overlapping taxing units. And I think that's important to know in discussions regarding TIF areas. So the TIF revenues, at least here in the state of Indiana, are very flexible in their use in some of the other states I work in as well. Um, this is a list of various type of infrastructure projects that TIF revenues can be spent on. Um, so sewer water lines obviously are an integral part of any redevelopment or transformative project. Roads, roundabouts, um, buildings, land acquisition, um, all sorts of, of projects. Again, very flexible in its use. 
as far as how those TIFs can be, the TIF revenues can be utilized, they can be utilized on a pay-as-you-go basis. So if you have kind of a one-time project that needs to be paid, you can utilize, you know, your cash on hand to fund that project. Or you can leverage those revenues over a certain period of time, again, depending upon your state's laws, to pay bond payments. So basically, if you had a larger $5 million project that you needed to do or something larger than that, you could issue a bond, get your $5 million today, and then like a mortgage, pay for it over a certain period of time. And that's what a lot of communities who have uh, larger projects that they want to do get projects done like the city of Carmel has done. Did Let me jump in for just a second. Yeah, um, one, one thing that I'd just like to point out, just sort of on a big picture, the, the kind of the philosophy of TIF. Um, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't really want to use a tool like this if the development that you're trying to encourage was going to happen anyway, right? So there's this concept of a but-for test, but-for doing, creating a TIF area and doing the kinds of things that you uh, are planning to do with the TIF. Uh, this development's not going to happen, or it's not going to happen the way that you want it to happen, as Henry was pointing out. And so it's, it's really critical. That's a critical kind of threshold question is, you know, our, the way our statute in Indiana says, would the ordinary operations of private enterprise do what you're already, you know, trying to get done? If that's the case, there's no reason to use uh, a tool like TIF. But we find quite often that there's some kind of obstacle to, to development, and that might be that there's a very high cost of land in downtown urban areas. The cost of structured parking is, is often the critical thing that, that prohibits a development from happening, and so you need some, some tool to help pay for that structured parking. On the outskirts, it might be an environmental problem, uh, things like that, but uh, it's kind of a neat idea that we've got some kind of obstacle to development uh, in order to attract that development, we'll use that development's own taxes to overcome the obstacle. So that's kind of the, the theory of TIF, and it's, it's, a, it's a pretty neat tool, and as Heidi says, it's been used extensively, not only in our country, but around the world. Can I ask a follow-up question on that? Yes, please. Sure. So with the but for test, in Colorado, the way they say it is, the tax increment wouldn't happen but for the development. So they kind of reverse it, rather than the development wouldn't happen but for the TIF, you wouldn't get the taxes if the development wasn't there. So that's the justification that often gets used. You think that's an inaccurate, that's an inversion of the but for? Can you, can you tell me Sounds again the how same to me. Yeah, it sounds like chicken and egg right there. They say, well, we're going to incentivize this because if the development wasn't there, we wouldn't get the taxes. Instead of if we didn't give them the increment, they wouldn't develop. Yeah, so I guess I guess I would. It really does seem like kind of the same thing. You're basically saying if we don't put this tool in place, it isn't going to happen, right? One way or the other, and and I think that's the critical. They're just saying this is going to generate more revenue. Therefore, we should give them back. So so you're saying, and, and for those that are listening, and the question in Colorado is that. Um, are you saying that it, that the development could happen anyway on its own? Yeah, they generally don't demonstrate to us that it's going Yeah, to but, but, they but. They say, oh, well, someone in the next county over wants to do the same. Yeah, well, I, I don't, I, yeah, that wouldn't be, that wouldn't be similar to uh, let me, the Indiana approach. Let me use an example. Uh, maybe some of you have had a chance to uh, go to Anthony's ha shop house in the last couple of days. It's a uh, part of the Mona on a main project that's on Main Street and the Mona. So that was a, a parcel of land where a, a independent steakhouse wanted to build a standalone, fairly small independent steakhouse. We, we came in and we said, let's look at this land plan a little differently. So, they, so what ended up happening was that they built the steakhouse with the rooftop bar. Next to it was 45,000 square feet of office. Next to that was seven townhomes. All of that project parked in a structured parking garage. And obviously the office and the steakhouse flexed the parking. That garage was paid for with TIF. So maybe some development would happen without it, but you wouldn't get the vibrancy and the urban planning that you wanted. And that project would never happen if the TIF from that didn't pay for the structured parking. Yeah, I would say each, my experience has been each state's a little bit 
um, a little bit more or less strict. Um, I know in Missouri they have to do a whole calculation, and I mean it's way more strict than it is even here in the state of Indiana. So, but general concept is definitely the same. Some more permitted uses of TIF. So, at least here in the state of Indiana, I would say it's pretty consistent in the state, other states that I've worked in, is that all of the the projects have to be in or directly serving the TIF area. And so, uh, again, it, that orderly growth, again, is one of the main concepts around TIF area. So you have to spend those TIF funds uh, for projects in serving or benefiting that particular TIF area. So really a, pl pretty flexible as far as capital project expenditures. Um, I, most of these things are kind of listed on the pr prior slide. Recreation facilities, we've seen it be used for. Um, in Indiana, some job training. Uh, if those you know, folks are gonna technically stay within the same community and work. So, yes, please. Sorry. You're fine? I'm from Bloomington, Indiana, and we also use it to incentivize Okay, so she made a comment that here in Indiana, she um, is down in Bloomington. Uh, I call that Disney World, because Indiana University is there. <laughs> Hello, counselor. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but she said that they utilize TIF to, to fund affordable housing, so that's definitely something that we see uh, here and really across the country. So this slide is really what we were just talking about with the but for test. Um, the, the TIF does postpone adding that new assessed value or those incremental taxes that you're collecting um, you know, to those overlapping taxing units, but again, it, it, is, it is for purpose. Um, also, in the state of Indiana, again, again it varies per state, we can capture, in addition for property tax to the real property, which is the building structure, we can also capture the equipment within buildings. Uh, that's the personal property. There are several TIF areas throughout the state of Indiana where that personal property is not captured. So there is an immediate benefit to all of the overlapping taxing units where there are TIF areas that only capture the building portion of the, the new development. Let's see if I can keep up with my slide here. Um, and then again, as I mentioned earlier, all of that assessed value um, or incremental sales tax goes back to those overlapping taxing units once that, the TIF area sunsets. Some costs and benefits to having a TIF area, again, it finances the incentives to produce that, that private investment. Uh, local governments throughout this the country really don't have a whole lot of tools to work with to generate new revenues. Um, so it, it is truly one of very few tools that local governments have um, to fund development. The orderly growth I've hit on several times. Um, here in Indiana, there's no additional tax levy for the, the property tax TIF areas that are established, um, unlike some of the other incentives, like a neighborhood improvement district. Um, it avoids referendum if you have referendum in your state. And again, it's just overall flexible in its use. As far as the costs go, it's just really the, the delay in them getting that additional incremental uh, revenue to each one of the units. And um, yeah. So as far as best practices go, as, um, as you, have, you will hear about the city of Carmel, we've utilized TIF to leverage, or leverage the TIF um, to pay for bonds um, to be able to get the investments needed. Um, and then just as strategic planning. So a lot of communities, when they have TIF area, it kind of forces them to be more in communication with the school corporations and some of the overlapping taxing districts. Um, and so I would just say, you know, this whole strategic planning on, you know, where you're going with your community as far as economic development and redevelopment goes, you know, having this tool allows you to have more of those strategic discussions with other units of government to make sure you're kind of all shooting for the same, same goals. Some uh, more pictures here of how, how TIF has been used. Uh, a lot of parking garage structures here in Indiana. Um, and you know, the question always there is who will own, own and maintain that? Um, and a lot of times TIF is used to fill development gaps. If there's a certain type of development that the community wants to locate there and banks just aren't quite there um, as far as getting the project financed, then TIF can be used on the local side of the project to help fill that gap. Here are some, a list of projects for downtown development that we've seen TIF be used on. 
Um, so the environmental remediation, the site clearing, uh, the parking garage again. Uh, some communities have facade grant uh, programs where they can actually utilize the TIF revenues generated to help um, their businesses you know, do a facade improvement. So if you have kind of a blighted downtown area, we'll see communities put in, um, you know, if they have TIF being generated maybe from a larger industry outside of the downtown area, they'll collect the revenues and then put in uh, a facade grant improvement program for their downtown to help revitalize that. Um, and we've seen it also used in some co-working spaces to finance some co-working spaces as well. Such as these two examples. One in the city of Lafayette and one in the Fishers, but they are all over the place. So, yes, please. Yes, Chris Coppice, thanks for describing TIFs. I have a question I've spoken to. I spoke to an official recently in an adjoining county who had the concern, and she said in her area, TIFs are not seen, um, they, they generate skepticism because, in under, her understanding, the the funds that come from TIFs then get devoted to those things that the TIF is structured around, but they take the money away from other public purposes around that property, such as funding schools, uh, utilities, and other public services. I'm wondering, is that the dynamic that you see, or is there a counter-argument that, that she should be aware of? I would say that's a very common misconception, is what I would call it. Um, his question was, um, he has, or his comment was that in an adjoining county to his, that there's a lot of skepticism around TIF areas and having those because does it take from other units of government, you know, instead of funding a school, you're funding, you know, the TIF's going to fund other projects within the TIF area. And so it, I take you back to that but for test discussion that we just had that, you know, truly but for the TIF being utilized as an incentive in most states, that that development would not happen. And so again, it probably depends on what state you're in, but TIF is to be used again for that very strategic orderly growth. It's where you want to, to retain jobs or you know grow new companies to come into your county. And again, because local governments don't have a lot of tools to use to, to do that besides TIF, it, it is why it's heavily used to create jobs. Correct. Then say that ten million that originally would have supported, say, public services like the schools, that would still go to the schools, but then that incremental point amount would go to the property and the newer stuff. Is that right? Correct. I might just add on that too. The the way school funding works, at least here in Indiana, as you probably know, the uh, the classroom operation expenses all come from the state. They're really not from property taxes. So the um, TIF can't really affect those kinds of classroom teacher salaries, all those sorts of things. And even the other funds uh, that the schools have are what we call maximum levy controlled, which means there's only a certain amount of dollars that can be raised every year in those funds by, by statute. So even if you conceded that the but for test wasn't met and that assessed value was added, might reduce the property tax rates a little bit to get to that same revenue level. Um, but may not have the, an actual revenue impact that people think. It's not a dollar for dollar exchange. It's an assessed value difference, but it's not necessarily a, a property tax difference. It gets really complicated because sometimes if you're in a high circuit breaker environment in Indiana, for those of you who are not in Indiana, sorry, but um, there can be some circuit breaker losses that, that are mitigated by adding assessed value. But when you actually do the calculations, we've often found that, um, that schools are, are not nearly as impacted, if at all, uh, as they think they are. And if they happen to have a referendum in, op uh, in place, referendum levies are not captured uh, for TIF. And so t adding assessed value through TIF actually adds dollars through an operating uh, referendum. So just, I know we get it. That we can get very much into the weeds on that subject, but as Heidi says, it, it's an important subject because it, it gets. There's a lot of misconception about that around the state. We have a lot of conversations with state legislators on that topic. Well, uh, let me add a, another point to that. In Indiana, the two main sources of revenue for cities are property taxes and income taxes that go to the county and then get distributed back to the city. So, if you've had a chance to check out Midtown Plaza, Midtown. 
Um, on the west side of our Midtown area are two buildings. One is a big corporate headquarters for uh, Merchants Bank of Indiana, and just north of that is an apartment complex called the Rail Yard. We took the TIF from both of those projects to pay for the parking garage inside the rail yard that parks both projects. So we took the TIF to add vibrancy and bring a bunch of jobs to the city. Because otherwise, the, the urban planning would be different, the urban landscape would be different, and we wouldn't be able to attract those same kind of headquarters the same way. So if we use TIF to attract those jobs, it adds income taxes that the city ultimately receives as well. That's often uh, overlooked when we're just talking about property taxes. I have one Go ahead. more question about TIF. Um, how often do you all see requests to extend the duration of TIF? So once it's about to expire, hey, we want to extend it again. Yeah, the, the question was, was how often do we see requests to extend TIF areas beyond their original life? At least in Indiana, it's not possible. Uh, when, once you hit your 25 years, if you, if you wanted to extend it, you would have to start over, which means that all of the, what was the incremental assessed value would now go into the base, and, and you'd have to start all over with that. So at least in our state, it's not really possible to do that. I would add where we have seen it is, I would say, Back in the day, people would create larger TIF areas, you know, and if, if a couple of parcels were ag, for example, still nothing has happened on them, and that TIF area life had started and was in the middle of the TIF area life, that you could technically pull out some of those parcels and make them new TIF areas. So that could essentially extend the life of a TIF area, but it would still be creating a brand new TIF area that would have potentially a different or increased base assessed value to begin with. Okay, uh, we're gonna just talk briefly about municipal bonds. Uh, we don't wanna spend a whole lot of time on this because um, we wanna get to a couple of case studies that, that you'll probably find a little more interesting, but it's, it's, it's kinda hard to talk about um, financing uh, public projects without talking about bonding a little bit. And um, as, as you probably know, uh, issuing bonds is the way that local units of government, municipalities and states and so forth, that's the way they borrow money. Um, and um, they, they often need to borrow money for large capital projects, just like you would borrow money for uh, a large purchase like a home. For uh, capital projects that are gonna have a, a long, useful life, it often makes sense to spread the cost of that um, somewhat over the life of that asset by borrowing and particularly um, with uh, municipal bonds, the uh, interest rates are typically low. You've got, uh, they're, they're high credit uh, instruments in, for the most part. And um, we'll see here that, they, um, that, that you get some tax advantages. Uh, most, most municipal bonds for most public projects are what we call tax exempt, meaning that the interest income paid on those are uh, exempt from federal income taxation to the holder of the bond. That means that that holder is gonna offer a lower interest rate uh, because they don't have to pay taxes on what they receive. They're gonna, they're gonna offer a lower interest rate uh, uh, to the municipality who's borrowing the money. And that's really the federal government's way through the tax code of subsidizing local government projects and so um, often it really makes a lot of sense to finance assets over a long period of time or you know, uh, at least kind of matching up with useful lives and so forth um, and taking advantage of this uh, federal tax uh, interest rate subsidy. And frankly, the, uh, as you probably know, interest rates have been so remarkably low, historically low now for really uh, uh, some years that um, financing projects through bonds has, has just made a lot of sense for municipalities. These are, uh, municipal bonds are, are securities and so there are some securities regulations around them and uh, they're, they're not uh, required to be registered like stock would, but uh, there, there are separate rules that require uh, what we call an official statement, which is like a prospectus that, that goes to the marketing and sale of bonds so that, that investors in bonds have full disclosure about the risks and the, and the credit and so forth. So just briefly, uh, we're gonna go through just uh, 
generally the kind of bonds that can be, that can be issued. Uh, general obligation bonds are the highest quality credit. That's, that's when you pledge the full faith and credit of the property tax base of a, of a given entity or municipality uh, to the repayment of the bonds. And because the, of that you know, large credit base and the, and the requirement to levy the tax to pay the bonds, that always gets the highest, uh, it's the most secure bond that you can issue and gets the highest credit rating. Revenue bonds um, are, are payable from any number of different revenue streams that a city might have. For example, local income taxes here in Carmel and many places have local income taxes. Some places have food and beverage taxes. There are utility user fee revenues for water and sewer and electric and so forth. So that's, uh, uh, that's a frequent uh, also revenue source that can be used to repay bonds for, uh, for projects. Special taxing district bonds are another flavor usually of, of property tax bonds and without going into a lot of detail, most states, including Indiana, have uh, constitutional debt limit restrictions that are, are kind of arcane and outdated. Ours goes back into the 1800s in Indiana uh, to where the, it's, it's very difficult to do any project in today's dollars of any real size uh, and stay within those, those old fashioned debt limits. So special taxing districts are, are creatures of uh, legislature that allow you to uh, uh, avoid the constitutional debt limits. So like in, in Indiana, we have redevelopment districts that have the same property tax base as a city. We have park districts that have generally the same uh, tax base as a city. And they usually have their own statutory debt limits, but they're, they're on top of the constitutional debt limits that apply to cities. So uh, that's just really special taxing districts are normally a tool uh, to, uh, to do a property tax back bond, but do it through a little slightly different mechanism. Lease bonds are similar, uh, usually done with the same types of credit that I just mentioned, but they're done via a lease mechanism also to get around debt limit problems. You see an awful lot of major capital projects done in our state and other states around the the country as lease bonds where you may set up like a nonprofit building corporation to own the asset during the life of the bond, lease it back to the municipality and the lease payments which are secured by property taxes, income taxes, whatever that source is, um, uh, would pay the lease rentals which would in turn pay the bonds. Which I would add, um, lease bonds in other states are different as far as annual appropriation goes. Um, so if you're in different states, it, it could look a little bit different. We'll talk a little bit about economic development revenue bonds here in a, in a bit. It's the, that's, that's the model that we use usually for, t for the TIF that we just talked about, and we'll get into some specific examples, but um, uh, when, when TIF is used as a repayment source, uh, we do it through an economic development revenue bond structure. And um, some, sometimes it's, it's uh, efficient. In Carmel, we created what, what's called the Carmel Bond Bank, and uh, it allows us to pool a lot of different uh, underlying bond issues together and the issue them out into the public as one large issue. And that's just a way of, of gaining um, uh, some scale, uh, gets, gets a better interest in the, in the, uh, in the bonds. Uh, some cities don't have the uh, ability to do that. There is an Indiana bond bank here in our state that also pools financings, but in some in, in your states you might have entities like that that can that can pool issues because sometimes if you know if you're going to do uh, a million dollar issue here a five hundred thousand dollar issue uh, you know th those are hard to go out and sell in the open market but if you pool them all together and get some scale up you know to 10 or 15 million or higher then you then you you get better uh, interest in the bond and, and get a better rate Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to go into too much detail about this. This was the general obligation bond that I talked about. We call it full faith and credit because this is where you get the, the full property tax uh, backup. Revenue supported bonds. Again, these are, uh, these are a little less uh, secure, if you will, than, uh, than a property tax bond because whatever revenue source you have could change, it, whether it's a local income tax or user fees. Etc. Uh, they could be subject to the whims of, of the performance of the enterprise or the performance of the economy. And so um, 
Typically, you have to show some, some coverage of your uh, historical revenues over the projected debt service so that you can, uh, ha the bondholders can have some comfort that they're going to get paid. Um, but it's still a very, very common and popular uh, uh, financing mechanism. Yeah, and I mentioned special taxing district bonds like park districts, redevelopment. We can also do them for stormwater, sanitary. Um, Sometimes they can be used from user fees in those districts as well, but all, most of the time they're property tax backed. And we talked again about lease rental bonds. There's some not subject to the debt limit, but there are some other structuring issues that can make those a little less secure. Um, legally, you can't make lease payments unless you have an asset there to lease, and so you have to worry about construction period risk for the asset and ongoing risk of that asset being destroyed by fire or some kind of other casualty, and you have, you have to build into your structure some protections for bondholders in case that, that all happens. Is this... Uh, ABC bonds. Okay. Do, do we want to... We can talk about other case studies. Okay. Yeah, so I'll, I'll talk about this briefly, but I think we'll get into it here in, in a second. Um, so, can we um, talk about? Yeah, go ahead. Could we talk about developer bonds versus selling them on the street? Is there? Yeah. Is that a part of the presentation, or yeah, is that? Do you want to talk about that? Or? Okay, so there are really two types of bonds. I didn't know what we were doing. Sorry, improvise. Uh, one essentially backed by a general obligation of the city, backed by taxpayers, and another where the developer is essentially the buyer of the bonds, we call those developer bonds. So for, uh, for bonds where we sell those on the street, that's where you utilize like the Carmel Bond Bank, for example. We'll talk about this later. You put in layers of protection to protect those bondholders and really for catalyst projects to get things started, that's the only way to do it. We've been lucky now that we've done enough projects in Carmel where our newer projects are just developer bonds where the developer buys the bond and the only source of repayment for those bonds is the project itself, the single site TIF. And so that's um, politically uh, a lot easier and uh, a lot you know, safer, for, safer for the taxpayers. Um, I think it's, those are kind of the, the dream scenario if a city's just starting out. You got to do what you got to do, but once you have a track record of projects, right now, the last 10 projects we've done have all been just developer backed. Developers are the one that buys the bonds. The risk is all on them. And just to, well, I'll just elaborate a little bit. For, um, the, the, the problem, when, when you set up a brand new TIF area that's just around a, a, a single project site, which we do a lot of, um, it's very difficult to get a third-party lender, uh, a bank or a, an underwriting firm or anybody to, to loan money and buy those bonds against a project that's not even built yet. It's not built. It hasn't been assessed. We don't know for sure. We have projections, but we don't know for sure what those uh, tax revenues will be. And so somebody has to take the risk on all that. And, and I think what Henry's saying is that sometimes when you're in a really infancy stage, a city might come in and say, okay, we want this so badly that we'll put our credit behind it, and if the TIF doesn't materialize as we hoped, we'll stand in there and make sure that bondholders get paid. But the better uh, outcome for the municipality is if the developer or the company who's doing the project has to take that risk, either by buying the bond themselves, as Henry said, or by them providing a guarantee to a lender if the TIF falls short, so that the city itself uh, is not on the hook in any way, shape, or form. It's all, it's all based on the performance of the project. And the one thing I was going to add, again, state statute drives this a little bit, is there are several states where the local governments are allowed to give private developers TIF dollars directly. In the state of Indiana, that is not a legal uh, way of utilizing TIF, so that we have to issue these these EDC bonds um, here in the state of Indiana to be able to get those TIF revenues to the developer. But there are several states in which they can, you know, you can give TIF directly to companies. With that, we are gonna jump into some Carmel case studies. So I'll turn it over to Mike. All right, thank you. 
Well, uh, if you want to know another key to our success here in this, in this city is definitely uh, our consultants that we've used over the years. Uh, yes, even, even lawyers. We've, uh, <laughs> they have definitely helped us get to the point where we're at now. Uh, so we've talked about the different financing tools available to us in Indiana. Now we're going to look at some of the projects that we've done here in the central core where we've applied those. Okay. So when you look at this map, if you see all the different colored in areas, those are all different TIF districts, all allocation areas. And this uh, map is probably outdated by a few years. At this point, I think we're right around 54 allocation areas. And that does not include all the expansion areas. Uh, so if you see uh, the circled areas on the map, we're going to look at a project in the Arts and Design District, kind of look at Midtown as a whole, and then where we're at right now, City Center as a whole. And one thing I would like to add before he jumps into the case studies, kind of back to your the discussion with your county that's right next door to you about the impacts of TIF. So the city of Carmel has, they're probably like the fifth or sixth lowest tax rate in the state of Indiana, even though they have 54 different TIF areas. So again, I think just depending upon what that discussion is, you can s still utilize TIF areas to, to bring development and development even outside of the TIF areas around just basically to raise the level the, of gameplay there. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, no problem. So, uh, as you saw this morning from the mayor's presentation, this is what Carmel City Center looked like before. And this is probably around 2002, 2003. Uh, and as he had mentioned, you know, the Arts and Design District was not big enough uh, to service the entire city for our downtown. So we had to look at other parts of the core, and we were looking to this area to really house this Center for the Performing Arts and additional retail, apartments, office space uh, to really round this area out. And so the first step was land assembly. In 1998, the uh, city passed bonds that helped purchase 88 acres here in the city. And that's what really helped us so we could master plan this area and like the mayor mentioned earlier today, get us on the same le level playing field as green development. So here's what it looked like before, and here's where we're at now. So when we talk about city center, there are kind of two different parts to it. There is where we're at right now in the Palladium and the Center for the Performing Arts, and there's everything kind of east of the Monon, which was, we also refer to just city center on its own. And that is development that was done by Pedcor companies. And um, so after we had this lit bond, so back then when we did the 1998 bonds, that was all backed by local income taxes, because at the time, I think we had just started TIF areas. I think 1998 was the first time we had TIF area, and it was not located here. So that was the first step, was using uh, lit back bonds to pay for the purchase of the properties. And then we RFP'd the site for a project, and thankfully, Pedcor Companies was the winning project, because they have been a, a huge key to our success as well. Having a great partner like Pedcor, they really shared in the mayor's vision for our downtown with a beautiful architecture and the density and the sense of place we were really trying to strive for. And so phase one of this project uh, brought in 106 apartments, 12 uh, condos, a 268 space parking garage, uh, over 40,000 square feet of office space and over 60,000 square feet of retail. Now, how did we get this density? Well, we used, uh, I believe, installment purchase contracts to help build the garage, the podium structure garage, as well as do the streetscape enhancements that really beautified the area and gave it a sense of place, like the fountains and pavers. And so that was paid for and still being paid for by the TIF from this area and some surrounding areas that really benefit from this project. So that's phase one. Phase two is currently still under construction. And there had always been plans to do phase two, but they kind of really ramped up in 2012, 2013, and we kind of came to a consensus in 2014 of what it would look like. And so in 2014, um, but what happened is Pedcor came up with eight different buildings that they wanted to propose for, for the phase two. 
And the way this works is they said, okay, this is what we're gonna do with our project. Here's the square footage numbers that we have. Here are the different uses that we're gonna use for each of those square footages. And these are kind of the aesthetics that we're gonna be using and the finishes inside. So they give that information to Heidi and Baker Tilly and they work out the numbers and say, okay, based on the information, we say that each of these buildings is gonna produce this much amount of TIF. Okay, we, after those numbers, Pedcourt looks at it and said, yep, that looks good to us too. And then we use that pay future payment stream from each of those buildings from the TIF to size the bonds. And so in this particular in instance, um, we're like, okay, we really wanna get this right. We wanna get as much funding out of this as possible because we, we don't wanna come back to the well. We wanna do this this time. And so to squeeze as much money out of it, we did what was Bruce was talking about earlier and we put a special benefits tax behind it uh, to really enhance the credit of it. And so that makes it more marketable and this, therefore you can get a lower interest rate and with lower interest rate, that means you're paying, using less of that future TIF towards interest payments. You, have, you can have a higher principal amount and therefore more bond proceeds to go towards the projects. And so we used the funding um, from that bond to pay for a 735 space parking garage that's supposed to park the entire phase two, um, as well as the bridge connector that connects from the Veterans Way garage to the plaza level of city center phase one, as well as some streetscape and site improvements as well. And uh, as Bruce was talking, talking about earlier, just for a bit about layers of protection, in order to have a bond that has a special benefits tax backup and not get, have a referendum, you have to make sure that you're gonna guarantee pretty much you're never gonna hit that SBT. And so well, Bruce and uh, some other great lawyers came up with these ideas like, all right, let's put in these layers of protection that'll safeguard us from ever having to hit the special benefits tax. So here's. And the special benefits tax is a property tax levy, like backup, final backup. And so kind of the, the first uh, level is just completion guarantees from the developer saying, yes, we are gonna build each of these buildings the way we said we were going to. The second and probably most important are the individual component taxpayer agreements. We also refer to them as PIATs, which stands for payment in addition to taxes. And so the way that works is, let's say one of the buildings is supposed to produce $100,000 a year in TIF and they pay their taxes to the county and the county remits to us TIF and the TIF is only $90,000 a year. So then we go to Pedicorn and say, hey, you have to pay us $10,000 more. And, they, and the good thing about that is that this uh, agreement stays with the land. So if they were to sell that building to somebody else, that has to stay in place with that new owner. And so that is one of the best ways that we were able to use to back us up so that we never have to call upon the special benefits tax. After that, there's a kind of corporate guarantee as well from PEDCOR, as well as lines of credit that can be uh, pulled upon. And then one of the last ones is uh, a reserve. And so the way you usually size bonds is it's not like a one-to-one -one ratio where you're getting exactly, using the exact amount of TIF you're gonna get, and that's equal to the exact amount of bond payments. You usually put in some cushion, usually, you know, 10, maybe even as much as 25%. Um, and so here with this bond, the amount uh, of cushion that we put in, whenever we get all of our TIF and the taxpayer agreement uh, payments, and all that cushion goes into this reserve, and it stays in that reserve and can't be touched unless all those other different levels of protection fail. Once they, they fail, then you can use that reserve, tap it, so that you don't have to use the special benefits tax. And of course, any other funds available to the city if they so choose to use them. And so that's really kind of the structure we used uh, for City Center Phase Two, and that we apply to Midtown as well. Now before we go on to Midtown, I just wanna talk about the Center for the Performing Arts, where we're at right now. This was definitely done differently because these are owned by entities that are tax exempt. So you're not getting TIF from these projects. It's not a site-specific TIF project. So we knew that this was going to be the catalyst for everything we're doing here in the central core, like the crown jewel of everything. And so <clears throat> what we did is we knew, all right, not just, not just the surrounding areas and the, the, 
the couple uh, blocks around here that were going to be affected, it was going to ripple effect throughout the entire business corridor all the way out to Meridian. And so we set up these different TIF areas around the Meridian corridor and everything coming in towards uh, the Palladium and the Center for the Performing Arts. And we said, okay, we can tip these areas up because this is what is going to pay back the bonds and debt for the Palladium and then return the influx of people that are going to be driven to this area because of this. It's going to attract businesses, corporate headquarters, and then the TIF will rise in those areas and we'll be able to pay back uh, the bonds for this. And that's pretty much exactly what happened. And remember, when we were tiffing up those areas, the taxes that were there to begin with, they stay and go to the different tax units. So it was only because of what was happening here in the core, it produced all this incremental value in these uh, outlying districts that now uh, can feed in to pay off the bonds for the Palladium and the Center for Performing Arts. So here, now we're gonna go on to... Mike, can I interject yeah. something there? Sure. So, just, uh, so um, this kind of goes to the point I was saying earlier when, when you do a TIF bond, the, the, you know, the fundamental question is who's going to take the risk on that TIF performing or not performing? And um, the, the rings of protection that Mike described for, uh, for City Center was, uh, was a way in which actually both the developer and the city to some degree decided to share that, but the developer had to go first. And that's the beauty of it. And you had a, strong, a developer with a lot of financial strength. And so uh, you had projects that weren't built yet, but that developer guaranteed that uh, those taxes would come in before the city ever had to, had to hit its you know, property tax backup credit. The value of the city doing that was, as Mike said, it got the, uh, the lowest interest rate on the bonds and, and it allowed us to leverage the most money out of it. But the city stands very well protected by all of those uh, rings of protection. And you know, contrast that with, uh, with this uh, performance, uh, this, this was such a catalytic fundamental project that the city itself said, you know, we'll take the risk on this one, but we'll create all these TIF areas to protect us. And uh, sure enough, uh, it has. I mean, the city's never had to hit a property tax backup on any of this stuff. And, and the TIF has, uh, has performed and, and funded it. Thank you. All right, on to Midtown. So this is what Midtown used to look like. As old, rundown, former industrial sector of the city, uh, old empty warehouses, and as you can see on there, grain silo, which means this picture was taken back in at least 2011. Uh, but we still had the Monon going through here, because it connects from our, I mean, it goes north of here and goes south of Indianapolis as well, but kind of connects from the Arts and Design District all the way through City Center. And so we have this stretch of Monon and where there's nothing else going on. And we're like, okay, well, this part of the city definitely also needs to be redeveloped. And with everything that was going on in the Arts and Design District and the City Center, a lot of interest are growing in redeveloping this area. However, at the same time, we're like, the moan on here is not sufficient. We need to expand this. And also, if we're looking to attract some office users, we really need to have some, and retail, we also do need to have some boulevard lanes for cars as well. Even though we we're going to limit that, we need to have that in there for the retail and office users. Here's what Midtown looks like now. And there are two different funding sources to make up Midtown. The first is for the actual Monon expansion and Midtown Plaza itself. That was not funded by TIF. That was actually funded by a lit back bond uh, from 2016. And the engineering department here in uh, our city, which is an amazing department, they really spearheaded the construction of this project along with um, Rundell Ernstberger, local landscape architect firm, and they... Hmm? Who is also a sponsor, I oh, think yes. Henry's saying. Yes. <laughs> um, and uh, Crossroad Engineers and White Construction, they did a beautiful job with this, but it was not tiff backed. it wasn't kind of our, um, our sector. This was all done through lit bonds, local income tax bonds. And so this was kind of getting designed at the same time developers were looking at this area and we would be like, hey, look, look at these renderings. You should probably do something amazing here as well. Uh, and so that really brought the interest of some of these corporate headquarters, such as Allied Solutions, uh, Merchants Bank, uh, MJ Insurance, um, and also to apartment uh, complexes, both the rail yard and Midtown Flats. 
And so here this picture is of Midtown North. Uh, and we used the same structure for bonds here that we did for, Midtown, for city center phase two. And we did the same thing for Midtown South, which of course is just south of Midtown, uh, Midtown North. And guess what's on the west side of Monon? Midtown West. So uh, we used the same structure for each of those that we did for city center phase two with the uh, levels of protection and uh, SBT backup to get the most uh, funds possible. And in this instance, uh, for the phase 1A bonds for Midtown North, it produced $10.9 million in, in uh, principal value, original par value. And we were able to pay for the parking garage, which houses 580 spaces in uh, Midtown South. I think it was a $6 million bond, and that houses uh, 308 spaces. Midtown West was a $12 million bond, and it houses 370 spaces, but it is wrapped by the apartments there. And so this structure really worked well. Um, again, now we were talking about how we're doing more economic development bonds and it's all backed by the developers, but we had, these are really transformational projects. So we were willing to put the backing of the city uh, uh, for these projects to get to this point. So that kind of covers Midtown. And now we're gonna head up to the Arts and Design District. And it's now Henry's turn. If some of you heard about, um, you, you heard the mayor talk about uh, how Carmel had about a thousand people at the end of World War II. So this was the old, our arts and design district was our old Quaker downtown for the city of Carmel since, since the beginning. And uh, it kind of looked like you would expect a, a very small downtown to look like. Uh, these buildings didn't generate a lot of tax revenue. These buildings didn't bring out the, the population, didn't really add to the vibrancy. And so the, one of the first area, the first area the mayor really focused on was the arts and design district. Um, so we, we took, that, that was an area that really needed a lot of investment to kind of get it going and to add, add density, add, add the vibrancy. So we, the redevelopment commission aggregated the land and partnered with a developer to uh, put together a project that would be a true public-private partnership. Uh, we call it Sophia Square. So that's what it looked like before, and, um, and this is Sophia Square after. Uh, this project has two, two levels of underground parking, and it also has uh, this beautiful plaza, and I think one of our events at the, end of, at the end of the week is a reception inside the actual square, the public plaza of Sophia Square. And not the first time that that's hosted a, first time it's hosted an international conference, but Carmel was lucky enough to host a US Conference of Mayors a couple of years ago, and a lot of the events took place there as well. And it, again, it adds to the vibrancy, and it, but it's also a you know, public, true, good public spaces. I don't know if we have a picture of that, but we'll see it. No, no picture. Just imagine a great public space. That's what it looks like. Um, this, this was uh, an incredibly important project to kind of set off the, the, the kind of the new vibe of our arts and the, the rebranded arts and design district. So to put that project together, it also required several funding sources. Uh, there was a tiff back bond that was used essentially to pay for the two levels of underground parking. There was separately from that was also a, a lit, so income tax back bond to uh, help finance some of the land, some of the infrastructure, and the plaza on the inside. Uh, originally starting out as installment purchase contracts. So it, it's another example of where a project is essential to kicking off a new district, uh, serve as a catalyst. It, it's really on the city to bring as many tools as possible to make that project successful. Um, there, was a, there was a restaurant owner that was starting up a new restaurant around here, not in this building, but very close nearby, that called, and, and called me and said, um, hey, I'm opening a new restaurant, can I have some TIFF? Isn't that what TIFF is for? And I said, the TIF was used to create this area and make it vibrant. And, and 20 years ago, no, re 
the same, this amount of restaurants would not be successful in this area. But it's because of our use of TIFF that you are now able to open a restaurant here that this is TIFF working. And no, we don't hand out TIFF to individual restaurateurs. Um, but you are the beneficiary of, of the TIFF investments. And so is everyone else in the city. But this is another example of multiple funding sources to put together a project that kicks off a new district. I just want to add one thing, that this area before the AV to now increased by over 3,000% due to this project. Yeah. Is there more slides? Okay, so uh, before these projects, the ones that we were talking about, all really took all of the TIF and then some to make it happen. Now we're, we're, we're at a place where we can do developer TIFs, where the developers are totally responsible for the taxes that flow in to pay their bonds, and they don't get to keep all of the TIF. And so the, the, the projects we've been doing over the last several years have included developers taking on the risk of the bonds being paid with a percentage of the TIF flowing into the areas, flowing back to the Redevelopment Commission to, the, to do the next round of projects. And they are, you know, the process that we have when we do these is a developer comes in, shows us the plans that they want to do. They provide to us their pro forma. They provide to us sources and uses. We vet those from a construction standpoint. We vet those from a TIF calculation standpoint, from a financing standpoint, to make sure that it's a totally open book process, but we, we make sure that it, the developers are telling us the truth and that the numbers are what they are. And we, we fund these projects to make them happen because different parcels of land require different inputs. Um, but we've been successful that we've been able to negotiate splits of TIF with funds flowing back. Uh, you have in front of you a list of projects. The one, um, the one at the very bottom called the signature is, uh, uh, is the bottom picture that you see. That project just got approved by city council this Monday. So it'll be under construction soon. They said costs are going up, so they may have to VE, and VE some stuff, value engineer some stuff, but that value engineering is not going to take place on the outside of the building. The facade and the materials used for the fa facade are going to be exactly as presented. So it's that project with the two towers that you see there. That project not only has structured parking, it also is um, one of our first projects to have both uh, multifamily units and owner-occupied condos all in the same building. And we also got a bunch of land from them for a future street as well. But it shows the kind of progression that we've had from a negotiation standpoint, negotiating standpoint as a city, that now some of these projects in other, in other towns would require all the TIF and then some, but we've kind of transitioned to a place where we can get TIF splits and get some of the TIF money back to do the next round of projects. And everything's always a negotiation. Um, I might add that um, all the garage, all this, a lot of the TIF goes to pay for structured parking. And one of the things that we do is we make all the parking garages 75% free and open to the public so that everybody can benefit from the parking garages and, and park there for free. And one thing I'd add on this slide, um, if you are wondering what the numbers represent, so on the top line, the 75-25, 75% of the TIF would go back to the developer, and 25% would be captured by the Carmel Redevelopment Commission. So that first number in each one of those is what the developer would receive, and then the second number is what the city receives. So I think this is the last slide, and um, if you're awake, we're happy to answer any, any other questions that you have. It, it is tough to do a panel on on financing right after lunch like this. <laughs> it's kind of chilly in here too, all, all of that. I'll, I'll make another comment, and, and certainly if you have questions, um, 
let us know. Um, Henry used the word investment a little bit ago, and, and I think that's an important concept when you, when you look at things like this, because most of the stuff that we have talked about today, most of the financing has involved borrowing money in some fashion through, bond, through bonding. And uh, borrowing money can of, often be, you know, a controversial subject. Or should we incur this debt, et cetera? Um, but there's a huge difference between borrowing money, let's say, to, um, uh, to uh, fund operating shortfalls like we do in our federal government uh, versus borrowing money to invest in your community. And I think what Carmel has done so well, and Heidi and I work all over the state and, and, and Midwest, and we see a lot of communities. But what Carmel has done so well has borrowed money to invest. And when you see what happens as a result of these investments, there, there is a great return in the, in the form of wonderful quality of life projects, attracting people to the community, attracting businesses to the community, uh, generating new property taxes that otherwise wouldn't be there, generating new income taxes that wouldn't otherwise be there, when you attract families, you attract uh, the, the building of homes, home builders, uh, you know, you attract restaurants, spending, I mean, the, the multiplier of all of that is, is absolutely phenomenal. And, uh, you know, for those of us who've been around a long time and saw those, you know, we lived around here when, when those pictures were, were real, uh, the, the before and after pictures. Uh, it's, it's just been an amazing transformation, but it just goes to show that with uh, targeted, uh, thoughtful investment and using the financial tools in sometimes a creative way, but in the ways that, that, that have been described, um, you can really do some transformative things. And a vision, which the mayor has. Without his vision and um, ability to kind of push the envelope at times and challenge us um, in our jobs to... Um, you know, do what we need to do to make it happen. Um, his, without his vision, truly, it would not have transformed to what it is today. So, we have like three minutes. I don't know if anyone. Oh, it looks like we have some some questions. The lights are really bright, so that's why I'm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I, as my previous question indicated, I'm interested in affordable housing, which is a big problem in our in my city. Um, in Carmel, I mean. The, the question was about affordable housing. Um, there, there are several answers. First, before the mayor came into office, we almost never built new multifamily units. It's almost like we have new multifamily all done while the mayor was here, and before that, two garden-style apartment units, and that's it. So one of the things that we've done to address the, the supply of, of just multifamily is done project after project after project. The main problem, and by the way, we will have an, uh, our first affordable housing project uh, be introduced sometime in the next year. The big problem in the state of Indiana that happens is that tax credit deals get handed out by the state to developers that apply for the tax credit deals. In Hamilton County, the county we're in, almost never gets them, and the city of Carmel never gets them. And so while in the city of Indianapolis, the affordable housing, the tax credit deals happen with the help of tax, tax credits, they don't happen in Carmel. And oftentimes, if, if you're using the TIF to, to ensure that the urban planning is what you want, each of these projects have structured components, it's tough to do both. And it, we really need help from the state to not forget us when they're handing out tax credit deals to developers that apply for them. I, I would add, though, you do have several different types of apartments here um, as far as their level of multi-housing and, and the rates that they charge. It's not technically affordable housing, but... I would say there's a definite range so we, that it really allows, you know, 
all levels of, of you know, young professionals up to empty nesters to, to take advantage of those, those units that they're putting in. Yeah, and Counselor, I, uh, I do a lot of work in Indianapolis as well, and uh, they, have, they, they use the developer TIF bond model that we talked about now, uh, where the developer has to buy the bonds or secure the bonds themselves. But every time the city of Indianapolis now gives a TIF incentive for a multifamily project, they require a set aside of a certain number of units for what they call workforce housing, which is more affordable housing. And that's, that's just a condition. If, if you're gonna get the TIF incentive, then, then you're gonna do that. And they were, they were sensitive to the very issue you're talking about, that you have all these people coming to live and work in downtown Indianapolis that, that may work in the service industries and so forth, uh, may not have um, you know, super high paying jobs and need, need affordable places to live. So that's one way in which TIF and those, that concept have uh, overlapped. It's a good thing architecture is subjective. <laughs> it is. But I think most people would agree that the buildings around Midtown are a good bit higher quality than, say, some of the buildings around here. Uh, I think the general public would agree. Uh, I'm not sure. Well, I think Dan Moriarty, which is one of the city's main architects sitting next to you, might have some feelings or comments if you want the mic. The building materials bar. It's a good thing this is a subjective question. Some people appreciate those architectural details more than others. Did somebody else have a question? I think, yeah, right here. Yes, you. First, I want to thank you for having this panel. I know it's not really well attended this afternoon, but you can't talk about how we change uh, urban, urban design and urban building 
especially can't talk about how you change suburban development patterns unless you do the really hard work of talk about how to pay for it. Now we're both in the public sector and the private sector doing mixed use developments. One of the things I'm really interested in is uh, what's the perception in the community now? I've seen that your mayor has been reelected over and over again, but you also talk about the risk that the public sector is putting up. And I wonder what kind of reaction you get at city council meetings when you come forward with new projects now, and whether it's been an issue, for example, in council elections. I think there's a lot more uh, skepticism before, before that, before it was just a vision and uh, city center used to be just one building sitting out in a field by itself. Um, but now that people see what's resulted, people see how much vibrancy exists in these redevelopment areas, people use the on and people love the fact, there's a big, big sign that says wrap up in front of me, okay. <laughs> People used, to only, people used to live here and go to downtown Indy for, for anything. For, for restaurants, let alone hanging out in public spaces, those didn't exist. And now they love the fact that their trip to hang out and eat some good food and hang out in a public space is 10 minutes. And so we're, we're over that threshold and um, counselors, some counselors run on continuing what the mayor has done, and some councillors run on being against it, and the ones that run on continuing usually win. And I would say financially, the, the, if you look at the revenue compared to the debt, the revenue is significantly higher than the level of debt. Is the, is the debt service for the city higher or lower? I realize there could be other factors, but just out of curiosity, is the general debt level for the city higher or lower than it was when, you, when this started? Oh, it's definitely higher now. It's higher but we have much higher revenues as well yeah. to cover it all. And that's part of it is like the education because no matter what, you're gonna have a vocal minority that is against any kind of public input, any kind of debt. We met with somebody that likes to critique us all the time and we said, we asked him, okay, well, what level of debt would you like to see? He said, zero. So you don't wanna see any roads improvements ever in your city? And so that's something you're always going to see. And a lot of times it sounds like, yeah, there's a lot more animosity out there, but it's really a vocal minority. And I think when you see all these improvements and people enjoying the Midtown Plaza and all this stuff without seeing their tax rate going up, the city tax rate going up, I think they're pretty happy with it overall. And overall, most growing communities have debt. The, so, the, big, yeah. the big projects are able to then use the TIF to pay for open to everyone structured parking and and are at the kind of scale that can build public amenities, plazas, fountains. And these, the signature project passed six to zero. I mean, now we're getting, and we have a counselor here as well with us, uh, Councillor Austin. I mean, these are, pe people like what we're doing and you're always gonna have that percentage of uh, people live in their mom's basements that don't like what we're doing, but. Thank you for sharing. Okay, so we need to wrap up. We are going into a break until the next session that starts at 4.15. We will all be around um, out of the coffee we breaks. Can do, we can do one more question. Some of you, if you want to go have some coffee, have some coffee. <laughs> but if, do you want to ask your question?
So when you have a TIF area, say a property tax TIF area, if there is a building that was there and all of a sudden is demolished within your TIF area, you can have a decrease in your assessed value. Typically, the demolition is due to something that's going to come up and replace it instead. But Is that yes. what you mean? Is that what you mean? Like a reduction in assessed value? No, TIF, TIF is a, this is just like when I mentioned that tiffing, tiffing an area to bring a corporation results in income taxes that isn't part of the calculus. TIF, TIF is a property tax calculation. And you have to, it has to include a narrative. And so one of the mayor's narratives is when you're doing TIF that leads to infill that's already policed where the roads already exist, that's a positive, it's just we have to go to council and go to the taxpayers with the narrative that comes with the specific property tax implications. Yeah, so some states um, have a law in place to capture sales in incremental sales tax. So really each state's different, whether it's property, incremental property taxes, sales taxes, some have income taxes. So there, there are what are called green bonds that would be like ESG projects. Um, I would say that is ne not, not necessarily the driver of why you would issue a bond, but could be um, really interest rate wise, it's not going to get you better interest rates if you're doing kind of a, an environmentally friendly project. Um, not sure if, if that's your question. I personally am not familiar with that structure. Thanks, everyone.